Hello everyone. This time around, I want to look at calculating the value of the number e. Now e is, well it's a fancy irrational number that shows up pretty much everywhere in math and other things. I'm not going to go into the uh, precise usefulness of it, but it does pop up in multiple places, one of which is calculating interest. Uh, the, it's, it's the limit of the compound interest equation, in fact, uh, among other things. So, I'm not interested in expounding on the uh, virtues of E or anything like that. What I'm interested in here is calculating E. How can we calculate E? Well, most, um, well, well, most popular irrational numbers have some infinite series um, definition where you can add up an infinite number of terms and you get the exact value. Now, obviously, you can't add up an infinite number of terms, but uh, the idea is as you do that, you get closer and closer and closer to the actual value. One such definition of E uses factorials. And E itself can be calculated using this one. Um, so let's take all values of k, integer values of k, from 0 to infinity, and uh, add up the, the, recipro the reciprocal of the factorial of each value. So to illustrate, this would be 1 over 0 factorial plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial plus 1 over 4 factorial and well, plus and so on. Okay, that gives us the value of E. Uh, more precisely, that gives us the value of e to the first power, which is e. Now, uh, how can you use this to calculate partial sums, or, or the value of e? Well, that's use, using partial sums. Now, what's a partial sum? Well, a partial sum is quite simple. It's where you take some number of these terms, chop off this addition there, so say for the first three terms, uh, calculate those values, do the addition, and that's your approximation for your value. Now, uh, obviously, uh, if this thing is working correctly, the, the more terms you use, the more accurate your approximation. But how can you know if your approximation is actually, like how accurate is your approximation? Well, there are ways to calculate the uh, precision of some number of successive terms of, uh, of a series like this. But I'm just going to show you what this evaluates to, like how this evaluates. So, we'll have the uh, k value here, and that'll be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. We'll have the term value, and then over here, we'll have the partial sum. Now it's called partial sum because it doesn't include all the terms. So, so we can look at this table as we go. Ooh, nice straight line. Okay, so for k equals zero, well, we need 1 over 0 factorial. Now, you might be wondering, what is 0 factorial? First of all, what is a factorial? Well, basically, the colloquial definition is you take the thing you're factorialing and you multiply it with every successive smaller integer until you get to 1. So that means 2 factorials, 2 times 1. 5 factorials, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and so on. Of course, that doesn't tell you what zero factorial is. Well, it turns out zero factorial is just defined as one. Uh, so that's equal to one over one, which gives us a decimal value of one. 
And that means our partial sum is 1, because we only have one term, right? And at k equals 1, we get 1 over 1 factorial, where the actual definition of factorial, the colloquial one, works, and that gives us 1. Now our partial sum is 1 plus 1, so it's 1 plus 1, which equals 2. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to tell you that E is approximately equal to um, 2.71828.1828 dot dot dot. It does not repeat, though. The next digit after that, that last 8 is not a 1, okay? It does not repeat. If it did, then we would have a nice fractional representation for it. Okay, so after k equals 1, our approximation is 2, which doesn't seem very good. It's off by a 0.718 and so on, right? Well, let's look at k equals 2. That's 1 over 2 factorial, right? Which is 1 over 2 times 1, which ultimately gives you 1 half, which is actually... 0.5. So that gives us 2 plus 1 half, which is 2.5. Now, as you can see, this is closer. It's only off by 0.2 and change, right? Now, we can't assume this will continue. Uh, we, we can demonstrate that it will, but anyway, 1 over 3 factorial which is 1 over 3 times 2 times 1, which is 1 over 6, which is equal to, a, as a decimal, 0. Point, um, I should know this one, 1, 6, repeating. Now, I'm going to start showing these partial sums as fractions. So 2 and 1 half, 2.5, is actually 5 halves. So this is 5 over 2, plus 1 over 6, which actually gives us, uh, we need a common denominator, multiplying by 3 on the first fraction will do that, so 15 over 6, plus 1 over 6 is 16 over 6, which is actually 8 thirds, and that gives us decimal expansion of 2, uh, what is it? I have a cheat sheet here, so I'm just looking at it. 2.6 repeating. Now, you can prove that to yourself. Uh, it takes 6 off of the 8, that gives you 2. 2 thirds is 0.6 repeating, right? Now, this is closer yet. It's within 0.1, right? Now let's look at k equals 4. That's 1 over 4 factorial. I'm going to stop expanding the factorial bit. So that's 1 over 24. You'll note that I'm just multiplying the previous denominator by the current k value. So that uh, should make it pretty clear. And the decimal of 1 over 24 is 0 0.04. One six repeating. Now I'm, mar I'm marking out these decimal expansions here for a reason. That gives us uh, 16 over 6 plus 1 over 24, which gives us 65 over 24, which gives us 2.7083. Okay, so this is even closer. As, as you can see, the approximate value 2.7, 2.71, this is within 0.01. Okay, so as you can see, it is in fact getting closer. Now, I'm going to look at k equals 5. That's 1 over 5 factorial, which is 1 over 120, which gives you uh, 0 0.008 and then 3 repeating. 
okay? And that means we have 65 over 24 plus 1 over 120, which gives us some ridiculously large number. Um, now, that's going to be, so of course we're going to have to multiply by 65 by 5, so that's going to be 325, uh, right, because 60 times 5 is 300, and then 5 times 5 is 25, so 325 plus 1, so it's 326 uh, over 60, if I have my math, or pardon me, over 120. And I think I have my math wrong on that. No, I don't. So it's 326 over 120. That actually simplifies down to 163 over 60, in case you're curious. And that gives 2.716 repeating. Now this is starting to look even closer to 2.71828, right? Well, let's look at a couple of more. k equals 6, 1 over 6 factorial, that's 1 over 720. That gives us, okay, so 1 over 720 is 0 0.00138 repeating, okay? This gives us, I'm going to stop with this addition thing here. Uh, this gives us 1957 over 720 for our, our partial, which actually becomes 2.71805 repeating. And as you can see, this gets even closer. So as you can see, this is starting to converge. Now I'm going to run through a couple more. I'm just going to show the values for a couple more of these. 7, 10, we can see something happening here, which gives us some, some uh, idea on what our uh, uh, our rate of convergence will be. So, as you can see, the digits in the expansion here, uh, these digits here and here are the same, but there are five zeros here, and there are six zeros here. Now, we know, because we just divided by 10 basically on this step, so, so this makes sense. But now, because we're always basically dividing by k at each stage, and k is getting successively larger, we know this decimal value must be getting smaller. Now, if our, uh, if our, what we're dividing by is greater than 10, we're going to be dividing by at least 10 each time, which means we're going to shift, our, our digits are going to pick up one more leading zero each time. So on number 11 here, there should be seven leading zeros, which on my cheat sheet, cheat sheet, uh, there are, and then on the next one, on k equals 12, there should be 8, which there are, and on 13, there should be 9, 
which there are, and so on. And then when you get up to the closer to the hundred, uh, some of them you'll gain two, some of them you'll gain one. Um, and when you get past a hundred, you'll gain at least two every step. And when you get up to a uh, thousand, you'll gain at least three leading zeros every step. Now, I, I want to show something here. Um, now, based on the approximation I showed here, this is accurate to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven decimal digits. Um, and this number that will become greater rapidly. Um, so let me show you something. So let's just take a look. We'll have 0 0.005, well, 9 actually, plus 0 0.009. This gives us an 8 here, carry the 1, a 1 here, and a 0 here. So that's 0 0.018. Now as long as we're only adding two numbers, uh, our maximum sum of two digits with no carry in is 18. We cannot have a sum of two digits that's higher than that. Which means we have a maximum carry out of one. Now, if we introduce the maximum carry out of one into here, so let's take a look, 0 0.0099 and 0 0.0099. 9 and 9 is 18, carry the 1. 9 and 9 is 18 and 1, so that's 9, carry the 1. And then we have a, a carry, a maximum. No, this digit here doesn't change. As a matter of fact, you can demonstrate that the only time this digit will change is if this digit's a 9. So 0 0.099. 9, and then we add 0 0.009 to that, so that's a 0, so that's 9. 9 and 9 is 18, carry the 1. 9 and 0 and 1 is 10, carry the 1. Okay? So the only time this digit changes is if this digit is a 9. That means you can look at your current partial sum, uh, we know that we, ha we have, uh, we're going to have at least seven zeros in the next term. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is our cutoff point for the zeros. So we see that this position is not nine. That means that this digit the A here will not change on the next iteration. Uh, and as a result, we can be pretty sure that this 1 is correct because the 8 will not change. And that, then the next uh, iteration is going to give us uh, some digits added in here. The maximum possible value on this uh, digits going to be 9, right? But it's probably not 9. Um, and we know that uh, unless we get a long run of 9s here, that we're not going to have a rollover that affects more than a few digits there. So we can be reasonably sure that uh, a digit that hasn't that's several places to the left of the uh, last of the first non-zero decimal digit is likely going to be stable. Uh, there may be a few outliers where that's not the case, but as the number of leading zeros increases in the decimal, you'll get more and more digits will stabilize uh, at each term. Uh, so if you want to show that for yourself, you can uh, dig up a computer program and, uh, and run through it. Uh, or you can calculate it manually. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, we've got several iterations here where we've got the 718 
are all the same. So we can be pretty sure that the 718 is correct, especially since these digits are marching off here. Now, as your uh, denominator in your factorials gets larger, uh, you know, as, e as each step in the factorial gets larger, uh, you can be more and more sure that the digits you've got to, are stable. Now, there is a formula you can use to calculate this. I haven't looked it up, and it's a little bit of a brain breaker um, involving logarithms and all of that business. But uh, you can be pretty sure that unless you've got a 9 in, in your last digit over here, that it's not going to uh, shift over. Now, let's go back up here. So here, 0 0.5, well, we have a zero, or our first non-zero digit is right after the decimal point, so we know right after the decimal point is going to change. And the previous value after the decimal point is zero, so we know that no other digit can change. Now let's look at this one. Our first non-zero is immediately after the decimal point. And if we look here, that digit changed. Uh, but the sum of those two digits was, you know, small enough. Now, if we look at our next one, we have a, our, it's the second digit after the decimal point that, uh, that changed, that, that has a non-zero value. And then if we take a look here, um, our, we're, one place further left than that yet, the 2 doesn't change. If we take a look here, 0, 0, 8, we have two zeros, and we note that one decimal place doesn't change. Here we have two zeros, and again, we note that one decimal place doesn't change. We have three zeros here, we can note that two decimal places don't change. Right, we have four zeros here, and we can see that three decimal places didn't change. We have five zeros here, and we can see that four decimal places didn't change. And here we can see um, with six decimal places, one, two, three, four, five, we can see that five digits didn't change. Now, you can also see that we're, we're picking up an additional digit here that looks like it's stable. But, as, but you can be relatively sh certain that based on that pattern that you're going to pick up digits. Um, essentially, um, uh, it, the number of digits is going to uh, vary based on the number of zeros you have in your uh, term. Uh, the zero, leading zeros you have on your term. So as you can see, this can give you some pretty good uh, convergence behavior, uh, especially once you get down to uh, values where you've got dozens of leading zeros, you now have dozens of uh, digits that you can be pretty certain are right. And uh, you can actually, if you do some advanced uh, math stuff, you can prove that uh, some number of these digits are in fact correct. Uh, this little bit here should probably serve to convince you of that fact, but uh, it doesn't actually constitute a rigorous proof. But you can continue working out these values and observe that these numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller at an increasing rate. So you can be pretty sure that this is going to converge on something and some of the digits must be starting to be right. Anyway, uh, this shows you why or how a, uh, uh, an infinite sum like this can be useful in approximating a value. And you know, we only had to go 10 terms to get five decimal places to reasonable certainty. If we went another three, two, what, let's see here. Uh, if we went to, uh, if we went to, uh, say, uh, term number 15, 
Uh, our approximation is 2.71828182845899, etc. And as you can see, that 1828.1828 is in there. If we go down to uh, iteration 20 on uh, my cheat sheet, uh, we got 2.71828182845904523533939, etc. So we can see again that that 1828.1828 stayed. Uh, and at that point, we're having uh, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're having 18 zeros. Uh, so we, we know that as long as we have a, a digit, basically, we can say the, if we go right from the number or left from the, the digit at the number of zeros in our term, uh, we can take the first non nine going left, and that's probably going to be stable. Uh, or rather, the the first non-nine digit, the one to the left of that, is probably stable. Um, and then uh, we can, uh, now you can run these numbers. I actually ran it all the way up to uh, uh, k equals 50. Uh, and, uh, you know, on my computer that took uh, about uh, an immeasurable fraction of a second. Uh, but that gives us uh, something like uh, 60 odd zeros. Uh, so, uh, and there, there's nines showing up in the number, but uh, there are, we're not seeing huge runs of them all over the place, and uh, they're not immediately to the left of the uh, zeros, right? Like where the, like immediately at the end of the zeros for the most part. So, uh, Basically, you can just keep a look look at it, and and you'll see that uh, you you can actually look at a particular iteration and uh, be relatively certain that the digits are stable. And if you see you've got nines setting up all over the place, then you can look at it and go, okay, well maybe this isn't quite as stable, and we haven't gained as many digits of precision here as we might have, but. As the number of zeros increases per term, the likelihood of getting a cascade that affects previous digits that you thought were stable goes down quite significantly. Anyway, that's probably all there is to say on this, but as you can see, these uh, infinite sums can give you a pretty good uh, way of calculating these types of, of uh, numbers, like getting, getting a useful number of digits for an approximation. Um, now, obviously, there are different ways of calculating uh, E with different series. They will come up with different convergence uh, characteristics. And you know, if you really want to be sure if you've got uh, stable digits, you can actually run through more than one of these and then see when your digits are matching. Uh, and then you can be pretty sure that you've got the right, uh, you've got stable digits. But uh, that's... Uh, that's not for this time. Maybe I'll look at a different way of calculating E another time. Anyway, uh, for now, uh, that's all on calculating E using this particular infinite series. Anyway, uh, if you want to be uh, notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. Uh, if you liked the video or you didn't leave a like or a dislike, it least, at the very least tells me what you liked or you didn't like. And if you, have a, if you have some idea on something else that I should work out in a future video, uh, leave a comment uh, or otherwise contact me. I'm happy to uh, do look into any ideas you might have, remembering that I'm not a mathematician and that I am not necessarily going to be able to deal with the particularly advanced math stuff. Anyway, that's all for now. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.